Uh, you know, the 2008 global fi financial crisis, the 2008 GFC or what is called the global financial crisis is a, is a watershed event in, uh, in world economic history because it causes a lot of economists like myself to reflect on both the nature of economic theory and the practice of economics in the real world. Uh, at the same time, the crisis is not a unique event. We've had many financial crises over the last 200, 300 years. Economists have studied these kinds of uh, events. And economists basically find that uh, crises basically come in phases or develop in phases. So first, there is what uh, is called the mania phase. Okay? And in the mania phase, there is some new invention or some novelty, some new technique perhaps that creates optimism about the future. But before long, this optimism builds and builds and becomes a euphoria. So that's the mania phase where uh, typically what you see is uh, something called a speculative asset price bubble building in some market. In some asset market, it could be the real estate market, it could be the stock market. Uh, you see this mania phase uh, comes first. Uh, then, for whatever reason, nobody can tell why or uh, you know, what really triggers uh, the panic, a panic ensues. So there is a panic and then there is a crash. So uh, valuations that were uh, really out of sync with uh, realistic uh, uh, anticipations of the future suddenly swing the other way and you have a crash in asset prices, you have a panic. And, and then you have a long period of depression. So this, economists have documented this as being sort of you know, characteristic features of what is a financial crisis. Uh, what's interesting is if you reflect on this, what's interesting, uh, and this just occurred to me recently, what's interesting is that uh, in these phases, what you're really encountering, it almost seems like the economy at large is a psychiatric patient suffering from manic depression. Okay? Because manic depression has these phases where you have a bipolar disorder, what is typically called bipolar disorder. You have these phases where first there is a kind of euphoria, a mania, and then there is a panic, and then there is a crash, and then there is a depression. And uh, these are cycles that happen uh, with the psychiatric patient who suffers from uh, manic depression. Uh, the interesting thing is, the reason I bring this up is because uh, uh, the other aspect, which is the sort of sine qua non of crises, is this thing called positive feedback processes. And positive feedback processes are mechanisms that disrupt, um, that destabilize. Um, uh, so that is the main uh, feature of what, what, what economists have come to call positive feedback processes. And you see this kind of positive feedback process happening with a manic depressive patient. So there is some small thought or idea that triggers uh, maybe a positive affect or maybe a negative affect. But then uh, there is a kind of cycling between the affect and the thought. And before you know it, the positive affect has become full-blown euphoria or full-blown hysteria, or the negative affect has become full-blown depression. So this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of cycle um, is, uh, is, you know, is, is, is sort of sy symptomatic of what I'm calling a positive feedback process. The problem is that uh, you know, the, there is a lot of, since the 2008 financial crisis, there's been a lot of criticism that economists were unable to predict the crisis. And I'm going to argue that there is a real problem that uh, such critics don't recognize. And that is that it is not possible for economic theory to predict crises. And the reason for that is that uh, positive feedback processes, which sort of fuel crises events, cannot be represented in economic theory. So nothing in the language of economics or in the method of economics gives us a handle on how to describe how such a positive feedback process takes hold and then how it amplifies, how it builds. So one way to, one way to understand uh, this uh, inability of economic theory to represent a positive feedback process is to think about our own experience. And uh, our own experience of 
time itself. So we have all perhaps had the experience of uh, being engaged in an activity that is so boring that we are literally counting time. Uh, and by the same token, we have all experienced perhaps, uh, you know, uh, being engaged in an activity that is so absorbing that we lose a sense of time's passing. So these are, I will call, two forms of temporal experience, two forms of the experience of time itself. And psychologists, philosophers have thought about this kind of uh, demarcation of or categorization of temporal experience. Psychologists sometimes call the first kind of temporal experience ego time and the second kind of temporal experience time motion. Uh, philosophers call the first time of type of uh, uh, time chronological time uh, or clock time and the second kind of time or temporal experience philosophers often call chirological time or chirotic time. Um, the, 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 the difficulty is that these things that I'm calling positive feedback processes, these processes manifest in the gap between these two kinds of time or these two kinds of temporal experiences. So in a paper that I wrote uh, uh, a, a year ago or so, I, I posit that there are two forms of temporal experience um, manifest in economic activity. So one is uh, what I call extensive time. Extensive time is linear, it's Newtonian. Uh, the notion of causality in extensive time is also linear. So event A cannot cause event B unless event A appears in time before event B. So that's the notion of causality that uh, resides within the notion of extensive time. Uh, the, the, the arrow of time in extensive time is moving in one direction, one direction only, which is from the past to the present and into the future. Uh, the other form of time which I talk about is intensive time. Intensive time is, uh, is, ha has the properties of uh, chirotic time. So intensive time uh, is, uh, is cyclical. Uh, cause and effect cannot be easily distinguished. There is no past, there is only the present and the future, but even the present and the future cannot be fully distinguished. Uh, human experience unfolds in both these registers or forms of time, but the problem is that uh, the experience of intensive time cannot be represented. Yeah, there is no symbolic representation of that experience. Uh, and when I say symbolic, I mean mathematical, because that's the language of economics. You know, economic theory uses math. Uh, there is no mathematical representation of this intensive form of time. Now, this means that economic theory can never actually represent human experience. That there is this irreducible difference between economic theory and economic reality. Now, I will also argue that this is not a problem. It's not a problem because it means that there is at least one register of time or at least one form of temporal experience where there is no a priori or pre-existing reality. Because if you think about what it means to represent something symbolically, uh, it first presupposes, the whole idea of representation presupposes that there is a pre-existing or a priori reality that we are trying to represent through symbolic logic. Uh, but the intensive form of time does not admit that kind of representation. It is also the form of time, it is also the register of time in which creation is truly possible, where you can create newly, new realities, hitherto unimagined realities. So uh, this is the, is the uh, double-sided nature of economic theory, that economic theory cannot fully represent economic reality, but by that very token, it can create new realities that did not exist before. So the language of what I call real-world economics then is not only instrumental, meaning that there is, it is not only uh, the, the challenge of, of doing economics or the challenge of narrating economics is not that there is some uh, pre-existing reality that we have to find uh, the best possible set of words or the best possible set of symbols to describe with. Uh, the problem of economics is that, the, of real world economics is that economic practice is what I call ontogenetic. Ontogenesis is this idea from neuroscience 
where the brain literally finds new neural pathways and so the brain extends itself the brain creates new neural pathways it creates new aspects of itself and that's what I uh, am arguing that economic theory does and the practice of economics, economics does. Um, I want to be careful here. I do not mean that, you know, I mean, of course, economic, the practice of economics creates new realities. When development economists or policy economists devise policies uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that address some social problem, then of course, such uh, policies create new realities. But uh, I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about uh, economic, the practice of economics or real world economics creating absolutely novel productions, things that did not exist before. So let me give you, and, and doing this on a daily basis, not just occasionally when you see some, uh, or some interesting innovation, but doing this on a daily basis. So give, let me give you a small example of that. So in economics, we have this concept of uh, an arbitrager. An arbitrager is a trader in financial markets who basically, according to theory, corrects mispricing in financial assets. So if, the, if, the fin if, if whatever a financial asset is being traded in a market is being traded at a price that it should not be traded at, then the arbitrager or the, or the trader steps in and he corrects that mispricing. Uh, this is a very interesting theoretical idea and it is, you will see it widely used in all of financial economics. It's very interesting but uh, there's a slight problem, and the problem is with the way arbitrage is represented in economic theory. You will, never, you will not find a single economic model in which arbitrage is represented. Only the effect of arbitrage is represented in the model, but you will not find the activity of arbitrage in the model. So uh, it is a strange paradox that, um, that uh, that the, that the only way to detect the activity of, econ of arbitrage in an economic model is its absence from that model. Uh, and the reason for that is that real, in the real world, arbitrageurs are operating in both registers of time simultaneously, and the register of intensive time cannot be represented mathematically, cannot be represented symbolically. So the arbitrager or the financial trader who is sitting in the pit of the exchange and calling out prices, calling out trades, the conventional idea or the conventional story is that this trader is basically correcting mispricing. So he has some model, some theory in his mind, and he is, uh, and he is utilizing that theory to form a calcul, form an impression of what the correct price is, and then he corrects that price by uh, conducting a suitable trade. But that's not at all what actually happens. In the pit of the exchange, the arbitrager is literally making the market. He's literally creating prices. He's literally creating prices. Let me repeat that. Because his calculations are intensive. They are closed off from any kind of representation. We, as observers, we can see what he's doing, but we cannot describe it. Um, this does not mean that the arbitrager or the financial trader does not know any economic theory. Uh, a better way to describe it is that the arbitrager or the financial uh, trader, the market maker, the person through whom the fact of a price is coming into existence, and the price is the most fundamental economic variable. Um, he's not applying economics. He is performing economics. And that is what real world economics is. It is a performance. So the fundamental ground of real world economics is a recognition that there is and there will always be an irreducible gap, an irreducible gap between theory and practice. But this gap, the existence of this gap, it neither invalidates theory although that is the direction some would like to take the argument, it neither invalidates theory nor does it hobble practice. Uh, because theory is the very condition of the possibility for practice. So just like a jazz musician has to know his scales and his chord structures for him even to be able to improvise, so also the economist has to have the theory, the model, 
which will create the condition of possibility for a kind of practice. Uh, yet this kind of practice is actually spontaneous creation. It's spontaneous creation of things that did not exist before and it happens on a daily basis. So let me conclude, that's all I have to really present. I mean, this is just a set of ideas that, uh, you know, that uh, are trying to make sense of why economic, look, economic reality is very different from physical reality. You know, physical reality, we have constants. You have G, which is 9.8 meters per second square, and you have the speed of light in a vacuum, which is also a constant. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever wondered, why is it that in economic reality we don't have any constants? Uh, and the reason for that is that economic reality is a live reality. It does not admit uh, a kind of faithful representation through symbolic logic. Um, but this is not a problem. It's not a problem because it means that the practice of economics can then assume a rhetorical dimension that is truly creative in nature. Uh, it's creative because it creates hitherto unimagined realities, it creates novelty, and it does so on a daily basis. So I will end with an anecdote about a friend of mine who, was working as a pro who is working as a professional economist, and he was complaining to me one day that uh, you know, they were sitting in the boardroom, in a corporate boardroom, and discussing what the Reserve Bank of India should do about the interest rate. And uh, he was saying that you know, he was working in the economics department of that corporation, and so he said to me that uh, you know, we had all these charts, and we had all these models, and uh, projections, and simulations, and nobody, the, you know, the CEO and the uh, rest of the gang, they just didn't pay any attention to us. They didn't want to know about all our projections and simulations and models. And I said to him, but that's, that's perfect. I mean, it's perfectly obvious why they were not concerned about your models. It's because when you actually practice economics, it is not that you're applying a model. You're not applying a theory. You're actually performing a, a something that is both a science and an art. You're actually creating something that is entirely new. And uh, so this is the thought that I will uh, leave the audience with. Uh, uh, this is my take on what real world economics is. It's my take on why real world economics is truly a creative enterprise uh, in an ontological sense. Um, thank you.